just last year, the European Commissioner for Energy and uh, the Vice President of the European Commission, Maro Shevkovic, was promoting the EU Green Hydro uh, Battery Alliance. Not Hydrogen, but Battery Alliance. Uh, he was promoting it right this place. And now you come up with European stack for transport applications. Are you contradicting him? No, absolutely, we are, uh, we are not contradicting each other. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. I think it's uh, great to talk about the European fuel cell uh, stacks. No, uh, we believe that all the technologies will be uh, required uh, to reach the Paris goals, uh, the climate goals that we have, and especially batteries and, and fuel cells. I mean, they are complementary. I mean, they each serve uh, their own uh, niche applications or their own applications, and so we cannot do without both of them. I think we, we in the hydrogen community or the fuel cell community, we, we know this, mm. uh, of course. And it's, it's electric driving. Uh, with hydrogen driving, is electric driving with a fuel cell. Uh, but I have often the impression the electromobility guys, they don't know it really. It's true. That's also, I mean, uh, from the fuel cell uh, sector, we always say, look, it's uh, complementary. We need both. Uh, the battery guys are... Uh, rather uh, thinking that only one technology can do everything, which is not true. I mean, um, we have, uh, for example, I, when I talk to taxi drivers, I mean, taxi drivers said very clearly, I mean, for us, every one minute counts, it's money. So uh, they need uh, fuel cells because you can uh, refuel in, in three minutes, uh, you can drive 500 kilometers, and you're very flexible. So each technology has its own purpose uh, very clearly. I've talked with people from, from Toyota who are promoting hydrogen mobility very strongly and they say, well, it, the hydrogen will not come because of mobility. It will come because we will have the hydrogen. Uh, what do you think about that one? Absolutely, and especially in Europe. The main, uh, the main driver for Europe is the energy. Uh, I mean, we will have very soon a lot of renewable energy that we will need to store because if our electricity grid is full, what do we do? You cannot store it in batteries for a long term, especially because we need a lot of energy in the winter while we produce a lot of energy in the summer. So you need to have this seasonal storage and that is very clear, hydrogen is the best way to do it. And so once you have your hydrogen as well, you have to use it or you can use it in your mobility. And the best usage would be in mobility. Yeah? Yes, uh, definitely, because also it brings a lot of value at that time. And secondly, we will see a lot of applications in the heavy duty. Um, there it's clear that uh, with batteries, just simply doesn't work. I mean, if you see trucks, buses, but also uh, maritime aviation, it's clear that that's the applications that you have to go for. But in cars, you will have some niche areas as well, long distance or heavy usage area. Those cars will need fuel cell cars. And I believe everybody who has an electric car and sees a fuel cell car right next to him, and he has to pull out the cable yeah. in winter time and getting dirty with the ta cable. And then he sees his neighbor just refueling his, his uh, car uh, in, in five <laughs> minutes time. They will be very... It was uh, funny. I, I had this experience in, in Norway. I mean, I was there with our fuel cell car and I was just going there to refuel in, in three minutes. And there was a, a number of Tesla cars and one was actually waiting. One guy was sleeping in his car while he was recharging. So, and, and we had with our two fuel cell cars, we came there, we refueled, and we were gone in five minutes. And uh, this, yeah, and these guys, they see that. Huh? Well, time will tell. <laughs> what will, <laughs> but the customer will, will tell in the end. Uh, Bart, we have to talk a little bit about the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking, what it exactly is. As far as I know, it's a public-private partnership. Who are the partners? Yeah, we have three partners. Uh, we have, of course, the European Commission. They put a lot of money on the table. We received 665 million euro from the European Commission in order to do research projects in the field of hydrogen and fuel cells, really with the aim to bring uh, products on the market by 2020. And actually, today, we can see a lot of these projects already. Uh, at the other hand, we have two more partners. It's uh, private partners. One is Hydrogen Europe Research. Research has uh, have about 70 uh, research institutions, universities who, uh, who are in that association. And the other partner is the Hydrogen Europe Industry with about 130 uh, companies. 50% are SMEs, small, medium enterprises. So the, the joint undertaking is something like an enabler for the implementation for the technology, is that exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. We have at the moment 244 projects across Europe. We have invested 1.8 billion euro together private-public, so, and it's about half-half each uh, in this technology. And I think today we start really seeing uh, 
the fruits of this because uh, we just heard also VDMA, I mean, looks a bright future. Uh, but also we finished this study, uh, the hydrogen roadmap for Europe. And uh, this was uh, launched uh, last uh, month. Uh, we clearly showed in 2050 what this industry can bring to Europe. And actually we can create 5.4 million jobs in Europe by using uh, hydrogen and fuel cells. And at the same time, around 820 um, million euros in revenues every year. So I think that's very interesting. So the first fruits are ripe and they look delicious. Uh, let's talk about one of these fruit, uh, which are the stacks for, mob for yeah. mobility. Uh, as far as I know, you, you invested like uh, around 100 million euro in the research of uh, transport applications. Is that right? In indeed. Uh, we uh, invested 100 million euro in uh, transport research because we wanted to build uh, a European fuel cell stack. I mean, as we all know, uh, at the moment, I mean, 10 years ago, we did not have so many European fuel cell stacks manufactured. Uh, they came from outside of Europe, which was important, uh, but we needed to have our own uh, base. Like and Ballard so and Hydrogenics exactly, and, and companies and like that. Yes. Like that. But uh, today we have established five, I would say five European uh, OEMs, stack manufacturers OEMs in Europe, which are really now uh, ready to go into deployment. Uh, really, they needed a lot of uh, research and we helped them a lot. And I would make the call here to uh, also our European OEMs, truck manufacturers, bus manufacturers, to look to our European fuel cell stack manufacturers when they think about their projects or when they want to make a demo models and so on. Because they are really good, really, really good. So there, there were two projects going on. It's still going on. It's, it's called uh, Autostack, and the, the one is Autostack Core. Uh, who was involved in that project? Well, basically, uh, the OEMs were very much involved, the uh, OEMs. Uh, we had BMW, Daimler, uh, also uh, Volkswagen, Audi. Really? Volkswagen was involved? Yeah, I know, I know. I, I was expecting that question, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, Can't I can't mean, believe it. <laughs> Maybe only Audi. They, they allowed Audi to be involved. Yeah, it's Audi who is involved, indeed. And, uh, but also Ford and Köln is involved uh, as well. And, but also then we have uh, researchers but, and also uh, stack manufacturers involved as well. So it's really a, a European-wide project. And it's uh, very successful because uh, we had a couple of research projects after each other really to, to, bring, to make this uh, European fuel cell stack. And I can tell you honestly, it's one of the best of the world. I mean, the KPIs from cost perspective, but also efficiency per, uh, perspective, is one of the best stack in the world. And actually, the Europeans did not yet found out that it's the best of the world, but some others in the world found it out. <laughs> okay, so so other other parts of the world are already buying these, yeah, these, exactly. these stacks because they found out it's the best in the world. Exactly. So we have this uh, company in uh, in the US, Nikola yeah. Trucks. Actually, they uh, bought this stack mm -hmm. for uh, their own truck application, and the integration is also done by by Bosch, uh, by the way. And so it's amazing that uh, the European OEMs did not yet use European stack, but non-European OEMs are using it and actually coming to Europe because we heard that uh, Nicola will probably very soon also come to Europe because, to be very honest, our Euro uh, European uh, truck OEMs, they were sleeping, let's be honest. That's why we're here, Bart, to tell the European OEMs, use it, it's the best stack in the world and it's, it's a European stack. You yeah. know? So yeah. it's not just a concept, it is being produced. Do I understand that correctly? Exactly, because the, the following up uh, project of uh, AutoStack is AutoStack Industry, which is basically now uh, the, Europe, uh, the German industry with uh, also the German government, they put 60 million euro in that uh, project to build actually a production facility between 10,000 to 30,000 units per yearly capacity. Uh, and it's built in Sweden. So it's really, it's showing that, okay, the European OEMs, car OEMs in this case, they are really willing to, to go into the production. As far as I know, that's the first serious volume production of stacks in Europe, isn't it? I think it? it's the biggest one in Europe, yes. And yeah. that one, I mean, there are other ones, but they are very, very small. There's more demo scales, but that one will be serious stuff, yeah. But please explain that to me, Bart. We just heard it last week or the, the week before right, by Volkswagen that they say they don't want any alternative to battery electric vehicles. They don't want any uh, technology openness. And they even force BMW and Daimler to, to comply with that. Uh, what's happening in the OEM scene? On the one hand, they do this. On the other hand, they say something different. Well, um, I mean, 
of course, each company is free to decide whatever they want to do. I mean, that's, it's a free market. On the other hand, personally, I don't think it's a very wise decision because um, fuel cells and hydrogen can create a lot of jobs. Um, we know that, I mean, if you have a fuel cell stack and a BOP, uh, you have a lot of parts there, so your whole supply chain uh, is much m bigger than compared to a battery car. So um, we, we will, st we will um, release our uh, study. We did a, a very, very extensive study for more than two years on the supply and the value chain. We will, publish, uh, we will make it public probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, you will be able to download it. It's uh, serious stuff. It's about uh, 500 pages, so you need some time to go through it. But it really shows the potential in Europe on, on our supply chain. And we will create a lot, a lot of uh, jobs with that. So we need to think about it. And, I, uh, and on the other hand, it's about the usage, as I explained to you at the beginning. I mean, today Volkswagen has also uh, big cars, I mean, SUVs and so on. I don't know how they will do it without fuel cells, honestly. And maybe they want to give away I don't know that. Either, probably. <laughs> maybe they want to give this uh, segment away to the to the Asians or to the French. I don't know. But if you don't take it, somebody else will take it. That's very very clear. And we see it happening uh, in the truck sector. Hyundai is coming to Switzerland. Nikola Trucks is coming to Europe. Toyota is also talking in LA with trucks. So I mean. We maybe Where should we? take it too serious what some OEMs say and uh, rather look at what they do. And this is sometimes different. We know that from the U US as well, so we are used to that already, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> indeed, <laughs> so indeed. Don't. But I, would, I mean, it would be more wiser if they would uh, not, let's say, talk about only one technology, but they really, because they know that they need both. So they should also come forward and say, look, we need to develop both. But yes, I understand it's expensive as an investment, but they should do it. But hey, again, we have European OEMs with stacks. They are ready. They have a lot of expertise. Maybe they should talk to them and help them and work together to catch up maybe with the Asians. I would like to look around. If there's anybody who has a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone right with you. Otherwise, I would like to ask you, Bart, the crucial point about fuel cell stacks are costs, of course, of costs. Uh, how far did you get down? How good are you in this, in this uh, plant in Sweden? You were just uh, told us about power cell. Uh, how, how, how expensive are they and what are the t cost targets? Well, the, the costs are coming down uh, very fast, uh, especially because now we see the first applications. I mean, we, we, they start to go into the uh, applications. Of course, the cost will go further down with, with scaling up. You mentioned platinum. Um, yes, it's an expensive material, but we have uh, reached already a reduction of platinum with more than 70% between the first generation and the second generation of fuel cells. Actually, we are doing now a couple of projects together with US and Japan to go to zero platinum uh, fuel cells. Uh, we are sure that we will get there in a couple of years. On the other hand, also the latest, latest fuel cells, they use really micro levels of uh, platinum, which at the end will not weigh so much anymore on the total cost of fuel cells. So I think platinum was a big cost. Today, it's much less. Uh, probably we can get completely out of it. Especially when scaling up, you know, if you need a lot of platinum, you can't, well, you can scale up, but, but it's still costly because the, platinum, the price of platinum will rather rise than fall if you, if you scale up. But you believe there will be almost nothing of platinum in, in it anymore in the fuel cell stacks of the future. I believe so. I mean, we'll be doing a lot of research and I'm sure we will get there. Okay. We'll but there are, there are already um, uh, high temperature fuel cells like SOFC. Aren't they able also to be used uh, within uh, transport applications? Well, we did a couple of projects uh, with SOFC in mobility. And I have to admit that so far those projects were not so successful. Let's put it like that. So maybe here and there in the niche area, but so far we have not found really the right application in the mobility for SOFCs. Maybe it's rather in the higher. So when we look to and heavy duty, like we look to ships, there we see that SOFC for maritime might have a possibility and we might see something in the future in that direction. But for really for cars, Buses there, we s our project shows it's rather difficult. 
obviously PAM fuel cells are the right uh, choice there. But if we, we are only talking about the stack which is being produced right now and should be used, of course. Uh, but it's not only the stack. If you uh, you always have to look at the drivetrain if you if you come to the propulsion of a vehicle. Uh, so the the combination between battery and the fuel cell is maybe the core point uh, to, to work on it. Are you having that on, on focus as well? Yeah, this year we have actually at the moment we have an open call for a hybridization of the powertrain, which means we are looking to uh, build models which combine uh, batteries and fuel cells and try to always to optimize basically the energy usage. Uh, and, then, and this is, uh, I mean, the call will close on the 23rd of April. So if people would like still to apply for it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's about time to do it. Um, but definitely we work on that because we believe it's, it's important. Again, it's complementary. You need both technologies. They are, they are not competitors. But what industry do you believe will be the first uh, one to pick up the, the, the fuel cells that are being produced right now? You said Nikola is doing it. What, what uh, European companies could use it? I don't see that, that uh, the European OEMs are really very much into fuel cell business at the moment. No, the truck OEMs are, uh, are not. I mean, as I said, they were sleeping for a long time. They are now waking up. So I, I, they understood because the European Union put it forward very uh, severe targets on CO2 reduction. So they need to go into um, new technologies. And so it's very clear that uh, for the big part of the truck uh, segment, and I believe for sure 60 to 70 percent of all the trucks will have to be powered by fuel cells and hydrogen because you need this long distance driving and this quick refueling and that you can simply not do with batteries. Batteries and trucks will have a, a, a role to play but rather in city use, small delivery, about driving range maybe up to 200 kilometer but to drive from Paris to Berlin for example there's no way you can do it. So just use these stacks that are just being produced, the world best stacks, fuel cell stacks in the, in the world, and uh, they're pretty good, and they are being produced, uh, and they need to scale up, and therefore we need a lot of applications. Whoever thinks of an application, just think about it to use that uh, development that the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking has supported. It was a pleasure talking to you, Bart. Uh, thank you for your attention here in the audience, and... Uh, Thank you for being here, Bart. Yeah, and if you have more questions, we are, have a booth over there together with NOW. That shows also the cooperation on the European and national level. So please come there. My, my team is there. We can answer all the questions you might have. Please do so. Thank you very much.